after good afternoon everyone welcome to our city council chambers on a cold snowy afternoon i'd ask that you'd all rise please join me for a moment of silence and then we'll follow that with the pledge of allegiance Join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, the right hand, if I could have a roll call, please. Dean Hamo. Here. Sean Brewster. Here. Brad Hunt. Here. Wayne Barahona. Here. Tom Eggers. All right, moving forward with the agenda you have it in front of you. I'll take a motion to approve that. So moved. Support. Roll call. Brewster. Aye. Pan. Aye. Barahona. Aye. Hamill. Aye. All right, at this time we have a public forum for anybody wanting to make comments about items not pertaining specifically to other items on the agenda. If you would like to speak, now is your time. If you would, come to the forward, step to the mic, and give your name, and then tell us what you want us to hear. Seeing no movement, we'll move on then to the consent agenda. You had that before you. Make the motion to approve. Support. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Barahona? Aye. Pan? Aye. Brewster? Aye. Hamill? Aye. Eggers? Aye. All right. No, moving forward then to there is no old business. Moving on to number five under new business. Uh, discussion regarding an amendment to the zoning ordinance pertaining to downtown residential use. I'd like to open the uh, motion to have open the public hearing at this time. So moved. Support. Uh, roll call. Barahona? Aye. Hamill? Aye. Kent? Aye. Brewster? Aye. Is there anyone here wanting to speak to this issue of uh, the consideration of uh, allowing <clears throat> residential use of commercial property in the downtown area at this time? Briefly introduce the item here. Hold on. Go ahead. Please state your name. April Schaefer. Um, Hold the mic just a little closer, April, if you would, please. I'm sure you can hear me no matter what. <laughs> it's the uh, <laughs> people that watch the video that we're concerned about. Well, obviously, I'm here I'm in support of the zoning amendment change as it affects us. Um, we have three apartments in our building, which is just um, east of here, block. And we would like to bring a apartment in our main floor. So obviously, this would be um, our way of uh, getting a variance to do that. Now, I believe that the, the zoning amendment um, change is very, by design, it was made so that there's all the stipulations that have to be met in order for you to be approved through the Board of Adjustment. So I do understand that there is a lot of concern with us all of a sudden having a downtown with a bunch of curtains. Um, but I feel that the stipulations that are laid out, I mean, you have to have two thirds of your space commercial in order for this to apply. You have to have 800 square foot in order for this to apply. You have to have the two um, rear side exits and you have to have off street parking all of which we have, and I know that there's a lot of um, other businesses that it, that may not pertain to, but by design, naturally, they're not going to get approved for their variance. So it's going to keep it so that you don't have curtains downtown. We have a couple of letters of support from members of the community. Okay. I think they've been given to Sam. I'd like to see them. Yes, if you, I'll take those if you would, please. Okay. All right. You should have these 
in your pack, in your in, by your desk there somewhere. One from Dennis Clatt, one from Chris Knuckles, both in favor. And I think earlier there was one uh, speaking against it. Has there been any comments, oral, written, by the city offices? Anybody that's heard anything on the Yes, previous? I have had some people contact me uh, regarding this issue, and uh, they have great concern about what it might do in the future as far as uh, how it would affect the downtown. Uh, most of them feel that it would be an inappropriate use and signal the demise of the downtown as kind of the summation of how they would put it to me. Um, I understand their concern. I have concern myself. Um, in this particular instance, as I look out that window and look down the street, I, I don't know how that zoning could be done or because there is residential all around us right around here <laughs> so whether it's zoned properly or not I, I don't know and I don't know what that would take but uh, yeah. to, to I guess I'm struggling trying to approve it as an ordinance across the entire downtown uh, I guess I'd like to hear some more discussion I can uh, relate to Pete's comments I've also had people concerned about it um, I had some people wondering if we can exclude like Third Avenue um, in front of Ben Franklin and Prince, um, and then also the two blocks like uh, where um, the newspaper is and um, uh, like country florist in that area, if you could exclude those two blocks. Um, so those are the comments I've heard. In addition to that, uh, there's been some concern uh, raised by uh, some, some citizens about how we're going to be able to regulate it, how we're going to maintain that everyone is adhering uh, to that. Um, curtains is one thing, toys out on the front of the sidewalk, and stuff like that or another. Uh, some of those issues have been raised, so uh, I guess myself, I'd like to know how we're going to enforce that how we're going to be able to, to manage that aspect of it as well so and you know the comments that I've heard um, along those same lines uh, questions about snow removal or uh, responsibilities there I've also talked to some business owners that are worried about uh, how actions of a tenant may affect their business with uh, the downtown area being so close you know uh, somebody somebody cooking in their kitchen starts a fire burns the building down you know these are all big big what-ifs but uh, all things that I think we have to take into consideration and I would like to hear from Kurt about what his experience is in, because I know he's more worldly than we are as far as uh, the impact <laughs> of, of uh, people, or, or rather of towns that have, have had the uh, mix of first floor uh, apartment spaces downtown. Yeah, so. It worked. Testing. <laughs> it is now on. <laughs> Yeah, so I certainly appreciate both sides. Just wait. Yeah, Todd, we, uh, when we had the forum, we turned the main volume up, so you might want to turn the handheld down. Is that better? Try it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, no, I, I certainly can appreciate both sides of the argument. I think both of them are very valid. Um, I think the biggest concern um, that anybody will, would raise with this would be turning your downtown um, and you driving through your downtown, you're seeing curtains in your front window. That, that is a concern, right? I mean, you don't want to drive around downtown and see where you're a good business front, which could occupy a business that provides good taxes for our community, um, be a curtain in a residential uh, use. However, I think in looking at the, uh, the protocols and stipulations and what we're looking at here, um, I certainly think it's worth the discussion um, because we're not for what we're looking at, we're not taking away the front of any commercial storefront here, correct? That is correct. So we're looking at something that would be on the back end, which with the proper stipulations like you had said, Wayne and Tom, that you guys think through this properly, 
Um, I think it could be a potential good use in some some small fashion. Again, I don't can't ever look at giving up in front of your storefronts because then then I think you're giving up a little bit on what downtown use should be. Um, so it needs to be well thought out. I think there's stipulations in place that I think are outlined that give you guys good guidance to make those decisions. Um, and this isn't new. There's other downtowns that, that do these type of projects, housing. And actually downtown housing, if it's done correctly, is very modern and it's trending and it's, uh, it's a good, actually a great use for your downtown. So, um, and I would recommend you looking at what some of the urban communities are doing in Des Moines. Obviously we're not Des Moines. Um, but if you look at what they're doing at their downtown housing and how they're repurposing buildings to facilitate that, it's a good use. So I strongly encourage you to look at all the possible uses of what it could do. I think the, the only problem I would have is to, to come up with a blanket statement that covers everybody. Because it, as you mentioned, there, every building is different and there's Correct. so many different scenarios at play here. Uh, you know, when you look at downtown, uh, Kurt brought up the, the the trendy downtown thing. Yeah, that that is that is really hot. I think the thing that our downtown lacks is a unified vision, and I don't know that that's something that we're going to solve right here and right now. But being that we lack a unified vision for downtown, I don't want to make any blanket uh, statements or blanket uh, arrangements for the downtown space. But uh, I do recognize that I think a case-by-case -case basis may be worth some merit. Is the Board of Adjustments, I mean, if you have this amendment change and you have the stipulations in place and we have to apply for the variance, at any point can you not say, nope, you don't qualify. I'm sorry, this is not going to work. Now, this might work for top-notch stitching that isn't on Main Street. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and we have a building that has residential beside us that's zone commercial, but right. that's okay. And we have a 2010 exception across from Northwestern State Bank where 100% commercial was converted to residential use, to apartment use, and there was no verbiage to back that up. I think this amendment, not only does it allow you guys the ability to police that better, but it also gives you a way to say, no, here are our stipulations. And if we need to add it more like private parking or things like that so that it's even more tightening of it, I'm completely, I agree with that. Um, but yes, I, I guess I feel very strongly on ours just because we are sit in residential. Yeah. And um, as to, I just wanted to address the toys outside, the, the grills, the snow removal. Um, a good landlord in their lease agreement is going to police all those things for you. So our, our tenants, a lot of people, before we went to the planning and zoning committee, there was a lot of people that didn't even realize that we had three apartments above because you don't see our tenants outside grilling because our business is there. So we care about how that front comes off to people. And I think if you have other businesses with two-thirds of their space commercial, they're going to care what their reputation is, too. So. Yeah, and I... I, I just... I, no, I, you're 100% you're correct. Uh, I think the only difference that may apply there is that you own the building. Correct. Whereas a lot of these storefronts here are rented. That so then, correct. then we have to worry about them being at the mercy of a landlord who is either absentee or is more more concerned about making money than it is about uh, the business that might be up front. Correct. But these are all things that. I get. Yeah. I would be interested in exploring the possibilities of addressing this through. Is there a different zoning code that this block could be zoned that would be appropriate for that combination, or is it now? I guess have we defined the. The, the downtown area, and should we redefine that? I don't know what the possibilities are there. Yes. Certainly you could consider a rezoning. In fact, that's what April and I had talked about in the, uh, in the beginning. That would, be an op that would be an option to just to, for her to seek a rezoning. Is and there's a downside to that too. And the downside to that is is that her her use would be her current commercial use would then be grandfathered in and 
that could potentially create issues for her down the road because it's a commercial property that would no longer be in a commercial um, zone. And so, and the building would become non <clears throat> because that building, when it went up, for obvious reasons, used and took <coughs> advantage of the business commercial zoning, which allows to be built a zero front yard setback. If you zone it to something else, it would require a 25 foot yard setback, which doesn't mean it can't be there, but it does cause trouble in the future. So, rezoning is not a slam dunk, <laughs> yes. Correct. And the zoning changed after the one across from Northwestern was put in there, correct? No. No. Before that? No. It's prior. I checked. It was, okay. it was the zoning code was adopted about a month before that came forward. Okay. And that went directly to the, the Board of, of Adjustment. Adjustment. Uh, at this point, I think we've gotten a lot of good discussion going on. Does anybody else from the public? We're in a public hearing. Hi, my name's Carolyn Marshall, and I have a business downtown, and I am opposed to the ordinance. Um, I talked to Sam because I just wanted to make sure that I had a good understanding of which buildings would qualify for this, you know, as far as the 800 square feet in the commercial. And um, Sam and I's conversation led me to believe that pretty much every building downtown where I am located, for those of you who don't know, I'm at 314 9th Street in the middle of the block. Sam identified that each of those buildings on my block and also across the street would also um, be in with that, with the exception of a venture, because a venture opens up into her headquarters beauty salon back there. So um, I'm opposed to it. This morning I went out at 8.05 and I took pictures of the parking all behind my building. I took pictures to the right, pictures to the left, and around um, the old Eagles there, and there were no parking spots available. I myself do not have a parking spot out front of the boutique, so I come very early in the morning so that I can get right in front of my store. I'm delivering, I'm coming and going all day. I need to cater to the needs of the public and also to our funerals. So I've gotta be loading and unloading, you know, at a given time this morning, I was out the door loading by seven to be there at eight. But I have some concerns with the residential back there, also for liability reasons. Behind me, I have FedEx, UPS, speedy delivery, and my biggest one is Craftware Pottery coming with a semi um, from Omaha. So if we get kids back there playing or anything, I'm very concerned. We've got one small child that plays back there now that's maybe about two years old right in the parking. I do not have parking behind my facility for me. The two spots that sit behind that belong to Truly Scrumptious. So I have no parking. And then on the days that um, Dr. Brown is in, there is no parking whatsoever. I mean, I can circle and circle and try to get it, and obviously I don't want my employees or everybody having to park on the main outside. So parking is a significant issue right there. Um, also, like I said, the kids playing back there is a liability because where, you know, if somebody rents and they have children, where are they supposed to go out in the backyard and play? Um, the kitchen liability, I think I may have been, been the one that spoke to Wayne about that. Um, Right next door to me is um, Truly Scrumptious, which is an in inspected kitchen. They are in and out of there checking on her all the time. Um, like Wayne said, you'd have to make sure that the landlord was policing the place because that's under the assumption that the business is owned. Like, I think theirs is a completely different issue with what is stitched down the road here in a residential. It's a freestanding building. If it would start on fire, it's not taking down the whole entire block, um, you know, where we're all hooked together. Um, and I can identify with, with the concerns of what it's gonna do to our downtown. I mean, we don't know, but I go to market just about every Sunday, and we are coming home in the evenings to offload our things, and one of the employees goes with me. We go to a, a wholesale market that's in Sioux Falls, and on two separate occasions, just in the last two months, we have come home at about 5.30, either on a Saturday or on a Sunday evening, and there is some residential places downtown where they are outside tailgating, grilling in our downtown street, um, drinking beer, grilling right on the curb in a commercial area, and those are concerns for me. You know, that's not what we want our downtown to turn into. We want all of our buildings to be consumed, hopefully, by retail, um, so that we can continue to draw traffic, each with our own little niche, so that we can lure people to want to come to Sheldon, Iowa, and use those. Um, spots for retail and I just have concerns that if 
if the back ends end up rental, like Wayne said, I'm renting, and then the back end is renting, so who's there to police what's going on between the two, or you know, if there's parties, or if there's loudness, or if they're entertaining right out the back, or things like that. So, um, and the parking is my biggest concern. The parking is the biggest concern. I, I talked to Todd, I think, when I took this location where I'm at, just even about getting a delivery vehicle spot out in front. We talked about that. I've been here a year and a half ago, what, what I needed to do, because there were no spots. Everybody thinks since the Eagles is empty, that there's plenty of room there. But right now, the tenants above Revelations and the tenants above Truly Scrumptious um, which is about five or six vehicles are all parking back there. Um, they used to park last year right in front of my store, and they worked the night shift. So they were in front of my store all day long until like 4.30, quarter to five, when they would go and work five to five or six to six, and it became an issue. So then I talked to the landlords downtown, and they were fabulous. They immediately um, had some papers and some documentation written up. They put them out on all of their tenants' cars. They actually put some up on the doors downtown and talk to them about taking up all of the parking spaces because if all those spaces are taken up, we have nothing for the consumer. You know, they'll go around the block and around the block and there's no place to park. You know, a lot of our town draws in some older customers, um, elderly customers, and they want to be able to, to find a place to park. So I just wanted to express those concerns um, while you guys are taking into consideration the ordinance. And like I said, I think JT is a completely different thing, you know, top notch down there. I think she has provided the off street parking specifically for each of her tenants. Um, they are right, you know, residential on the left, residential on the right. I think, I think somehow if the ordinance could figure out a way to make some exceptions with it, I just don't know how, how we could go about that. Or if it would be a case by case study where the, the council and the board would be asked to look into each individual one when someone brought their desires to your attention. If, if you could look into that and have to just do a case by case, I'm not sure how the best way to, to go about that would be, but just, just some food for thought while you guys consider the change. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, may I? Yes, please. Speak to one of the issues that just came up. Um, the speaker just made a good point about analyzing this on a case by case basis. When you're dealing with a special exception use, that is, per your zoning ordinances, a case-by-case -case analysis. In order to get the right to use a property in this way under um, a special exception use, an application would have to be made to the Board of Adjustment, which requires a notice procedure, so opportunity for neighbors to attend a meeting and give input and then the board of adjustment would have to consider certain minimum conditions which are listed those are just the minimum ones that have to be looked at but the board of adjustment on a case-by-case -case basis would have the legal right and authority to impose other specific conditions and requirements based on the in the proposal being made by that property owner. So there has a, been a question and concern about what does this look like. That's the process. It is certainly case by case and provides opportunity for the Board of Adjustment to take a look at the specific property in question. I would also note that any decision by the Board of Adjustment is potentially subject to appeal, so there is that additional uh, safety net in place if a party feels that they've been aggrieved uh, by a special exception that has been granted. So. Okay. You, want, you want to clarify the parking as well? I think there may be a misunderstanding of the parking. As to whether it has to be two spots on the property? Yeah, so, I, yeah, exactly. So, the way this is written and as I read it, in order to qualify, there have to be two off-street parking spaces available. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be available on that particular piece of property. They would have to identify the two dedicated spaces or available spaces that would be linked to the residential use. I, that, is that what you're... Yeah, because I was, I was interpreting the ordinance differently. I was interpreting that 
property owner having to buy two spaces on the property? Well, I, I think that's that's a question, and I think the Board of Adjustment would have that discretion of saying, what's your plan for parking? Well, it's these two in a public parking lot. The Board of Adjustment may say, well, that's that's not going to meet muster. Now, I'm not the Board of Adjustment, so I can't make that call for them. But again, there would have to be analysis of what parking is available and whether the board thought it was enough. And if a citizen said their plan is to provide two parking spaces here, but the concern is that takes up my customer's regular spots, that certainly would be something that the board should consider. Um, so that's the legal side of this proposal. Whereas the current upstairs parking or upstairs residential isn't. Yeah, I don't have the the yeah. code in front of me, but I'm not aware of what's required for. I don't think there's any parking. requirement. So but, that's. But if that's the case, Todd, we're hearing through through her testimony that that's a challenge already. That there's not enough parking to be had to begin with, and they're choosing to park in areas that. We don't want them to park in. I understand. I was trying to point out there's a difference between the two. Right. You could make it more restrict shows or adjustment. Could. I just wanted to make sure we understood there was a difference between the way the two are. Well, I'm glad you brought it up because I was going through my head at the moment was how do we deal with what we got and then how are we going to deal with what we maybe want to have. So. I'm not advocating for or against. I just want to make sure we all understood the difference. Right. right. So. Thank you. Are there any more comments from the public at this time? Okay. I think this bears some further thought and discussion. There are pluses and minuses. You know, a lot of the concerns, the fire in the kitchen, the uh, kids playing out front, we already have that going on, don't we, with second floor apartments there? Sounds like it. Uh, you know, so it's not that big of a stretch in my mind to go down 15 feet to the first floor. But this is the... It's, it's just whether it's perceived to be a plus or a minus. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we have a but, housing shortage in town, so this opens up that. I mean, yeah, we, can, we can sit here and we can argue it both ways all the rest of the, the another hour probably, but... I think the housing thing has opened up. Because there's a lot of stuff if you drive around that's for rent. So I don't think where housing is tight. Just this Yeah, I think Wayne's on point what about what is the vision for our downtown development mm -hmm. and how does this fit into that overall yeah. vision? And uh, you know, I'd like to redefine what downtown is. Yeah. I guess I would prefer that approach too. It'd be a start. Because I don't have a problem with you know, top notch over here. It's when you get into the 9th Street, 3rd Avenue, that's where I start having an issue yeah. with it. And I mean, if we look at it realistically, taking the parking provision into effect, would there be any downtown business eligible for this particular variance? based on that specific parking thing. If you're not taking into account community parking or parking that is designated for the business. I mean, is it, obviously Top Notch has it. They have the cut in. The old Eagles building would have it. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Yep. Because there's privately owned spots around that building. Um, yeah, on, sure. On the south, south side, side of the building, those are not publicly owned spots. But there wouldn't be very many. I mean, it would be few and far between. Right. I mean, in between that, it has to have a rear or side access, not a front access. The minimum 800 square feet, it's got to be, you know, two-thirds of the business has to be for commercial property. I mean, there, it's, it is restrictive already, and, and it can be cinched down even more by the Board of Adjustment, if need be. So I think we need to just let this simmer a little bit. Uh, if there are additional comments from the community, both for and against, because we have them both right now. Uh, let's just see what comes out and bring it up for discussion again in two weeks is my, is my suggestion. And if 
we're in agreement with that yeah by consensus yeah. then that's that's let's do that keep the public hearing open and we'll have it on the next agenda I think so yeah okay, okay. we've had some great input I think if we can have more of that all the better okay so then there so will be no first reading at this point so we do not have to close the public hearing you can keep it open and put it on the next agenda okay okay does that require a motion typically you do a motion to close to close it yeah we're not closing it so I'm just looking around everywhere's by consensus I think everybody's in agreement with that so if we yes. can operate that way in this one I'd be fine with that sounds good okay all right so then I would like to move on to item B then, uh, first reading of the ordinance amending section 105.10 of the Code of Ordinances pertaining to waste storage containers. Any public comments on that part of our agenda? Something you'd like to, you'd like to add? Any discussion? I've had some feedback on this. Um, from citizens um, a lot of them are voicing concerns that they're having to pay for the can and they're getting nothing in return I said you're getting a bigger can to put more garbage in but they feel that if they have to spend that much money for a can they should have some type of concession going forward on rate increases and that because they said next year will be followed by a rate increase and then another rate increase and another rate increase. So I've heard some concerns about having to front the can to benefit the haulers, and now we have to turn around, and a year from now we'll have to have a rate increase. So I've heard that from about a handful of people, and I said I would bring it up at the meeting. I've had similar comments, and I'm just wondering have we taken that tact with the haulers yet have we explored that on how they can uh, since it's bringing some efficiencies to their process how they can uh, reciprocate moving forward have we talked to them about that right now the uh, what they're offering in return is is two additional recycling days so that's something that you would have to decide as enough. We are on basically the front end of a four-year uh, contract. I might, Angie, we have, have any rate increases um, scheduled? I don't think we have any anticipated, do we, for the do, I do don't we have know. for the garbage? I, the, the I don't believe the contract anticipates any. I guess it would be a question for one of the haulers. Are there any rate, are there any rate increases anticipated in the current contract because I don't have it in front of me other than a fuel surcharge of gas price okay 25 cents per account per year per month yep. and I know in speaking with the haulers they had mentioned that landfill rates had gone up and that they had not passed that cost on to the consumer that they were absorbing that cost here lately If I might. Yes. So, Tom, if I could more directly answer your question is, is that during the discussions on this, the reality is, is that because there's a signed contract, it's, you know, we, we could ask that it be opened up and ask for additional concessions. Uh, we had a, an agreement here that both haulers were on board with. And if I had um, pushed harder, I'm not sure that we'd be able to, we, we would have the current agreement that we have. I know that there's other communities, for example, where the haulers do additional um, cleanup days, yard waste pickup days. Uh, and those are all discussions, though, that, that we would, and some communities have weekly recycling. And those are all discussions, though, that are probably more appropriate for full contract negotiation. 
frankly, you do have the ability to, to say, you know what, this isn't enough. We want we want to go back and ask for more. And I I don't think that you'll get that. So I think I'm, we're we're willing to I'm willing to reopen that conversation. Sure. But I think we have a good agreement. And we have to start somewhere. I mean, yeah. we've identified, especially the recycling portion of of uh, this increasing recycling in the town we've had we have to start somewhere and this is a good first step uh, we're not in the position to renegotiate the contract so let's let's start here and then build momentum and then when we uh, when we get to the end of the contract then we can see where we sit after that and um, I truly do think that by increasing the frequency of recycling and uh, taking some of the guesswork about when the recycling is going to go out will increase the uh, use of recycling in, in town and therefore uh, will ease the burden on some of the, the trash and we can uh, look forward to some maybe some changes some things once the contract's up. Further discussion? Are you willing to make that as a motion? I'll make it as a motion. Support? Any other questions? Everybody understand the motion? Roll call, please. Hamill? Aye. Kent? Aye. Farahona? Aye. Brewster? Aye. Aye. Eggers? Aye. All right. Thank you. Moving on then to item C under num new business number five. First reading of the ordinance amending section 106.04 of the Code of Ordinances pertaining to frequency of recycling collection. Public comments from anybody? Discussion from the council? To approve. Oh, okay. okay. I'm Missy Gertler, oh, I'm sorry. and I um, am married to Mark, who does decrypt disposal, and the recycling, this discussion goes kind of with the last discussion that you had. Um, you were talking about our, we've been meeting about every month for the last two years, and what we decided is we would do the, re, do the cans, and that was our first step to recycle more. Um, and so we were going, to, our concession was, we had the quarter raise every four years. That comes in August. The landfill rates increase. Um, this past year was a dollar in July. And so that would cover those four years for the rest of our contract. And then we would recycle every Thursday. And in 2020, that will be five additional Thursdays um, that we would be recycling. And hopefully our recycle numbers at the landfill would increase. Um, because of the cans, and that was our first step for the second step to apply for a grant to get every resident in Sheldon a recycling can. And so that was this getting everybody to, to purchase a can, a 65-gallon can, is our first step to getting everyone a recycling can through a grant through the state. So they kind of go hand in hand, so I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. And I guess I just, along that same line, we have been talking about it for a couple of years. I think it's time to, to move. Yep. Okay. Second reading on both be November 20. Okay. Um, then at this point, we can entertain a motion to approve the first reading and move on to a second reading. In I'll make the motion to approve the first reading. Support. Roll call, please. Brewster. Aye. Eggers. Aye. Hamill. Aye. Kent. Aye. Barahona. Aye. All right. Item D, resolution uh, adopting new 28E agreement with Lynn Township in Sioux County for fire protection services. You want to summarize your meeting that you had with them, Sam? Thank you, Mayor. This is an update of a 21-year-old uh, agreement, which was signed on in December of 1998. And this, we had discussed this earlier this year. And um, the Iowa Fire Chiefs Association, the recommendation is for uh, a 
a valuation that's fairly close to what Lynn Township is already providing us, and they were willing to uh, to ink an agreement uh, with us that uh, basically takes it to the 60.75 cents per 1,000. Right now, it's at approximately uh, 54 cents, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this will then become the template for discussions with the other uh, <coughs> three townships. I want to thank uh, uh, Al Stewart for his help and also Brad Hint and been a good conversation. Yep. Okay. Any uh, and, questions? You know, and then this, you know, once we get this going, it, it's ongoing. We don't have to worry about renewing it, increasing every year. We know we're at the maximum percentage and we can move forward this is 21 years ago is when we had this first battle and some other townships haven't changed in 21 years so further discussion I would, <clears throat> I'll entertain the motion to approve the 2080 okay unless there's any other further discussion is there support for that motion first I'll support all? okay Further discussion. All right, roll call, please. Eggers. Aye. Verhona. Aye. Hant. Aye. Brewster. Aye. Hamill. Aye. All right, and then uh, finally, under new business, we need to authorize the hiring of Tim Lotion. Lotion. Lotion, as a part-time reserve police officer. Need a motion for that? Yes, please. So move. Support. Any comments? <coughs> Roll call, please. Brewster. Aye. Eggers. Aye. Barahona. Aye. Hamill. Aye. Hand. Aye. All right. Moving forward, then, Jake, I think we're ready for your report. Thank everyone for having me. Uh, today. Um, I'll just get started. Some new things at um, our aquatic center for this year. Um, we added 16 uh, new lounge chairs at our aquatic center this year for more seating. Um, and it's a little more comfortable. They're not just the plastic we used to buy that are cheap that would break about every other year. Um, we have some nice sturdy ones now. We're hoping that will last longer for us. Um, some new things you guys may have noticed, we have new shades at the Outdoor Aquatic Center. Uh, we purchased four new shades. Uh, they're not the ones um, we used to have to clamp them up and we had a lot of moving parts that would break in these. These ones are just meant to stand and there's not a lot of moving parts. So we're hoping these will last longer uh, for that. Um, and another thing that maybe you guys well is we got a, a basketball hoop uh, at the Outdoor Aquatic Center. Um, that was paid for by the Sheldon Noon Kiwanis as well. So that wasn't any cost to us, a donation by the Sheldon Noon Kiwanis uh, for that. Um, in years past, uh, the main concern um, used to be lifeguards. Kind of not an issue anymore, um, which is good for us. Um, this year we had, 20, we had 27 full lifetime. Uh, like part-time lifeguards as well. So um, we're sitting pretty well when it comes to uh, lifeguards um, in that regard. Um, when it comes to um, the, the document um, uh, that was presented for the comparisons of each year, um, you'll see that total from last year we're down $6,000. Um, one of the main uh, losses that we had was our daily admission, which uh, was down about um, four thousand dollars. So, um, when it came to uh, memberships, um, everything seemed to be uh, increased and decreased in some areas. Um, the only change that you'll see is the <clears throat> the family outdoor is at eighty two. But technically, it's at actually at 91 because of the uh, babysitter pass that we added. That's just a separate category. So technically, we have uh, 91 um, family passes this year. Um, 
last year we I was here we passed the the ordinance of having a babysitter fee added to the babysitting pass or to the family pass so um, that's really it that I have for that do you guys have any questions in regards of the outdoor aquatic center you know, usage was down do you think a lot of that had to do with weather um yeah looking it back at a rainy yeah and actually what really hurt us more than anything is probably um, just looking back at the weather was the 75 degrees so we're open but you're not getting that many kids and the problem is we're still full staffed so we're not getting the revenue that we'd like but it we're still open at 75 because our ordinance is anything below 70 we don't open so there was a couple times that we would push it back to stay open so we'd open at three o'clock instead of one just to try to be open no matter what so it seemed like we had a lot of the 75 78 and not a lot of people like to go to the pool at it's usually the 85s and sure. in, in sure. sunny so okay. and then with that then um uh Uh, there's an ordinance uh, that's looking to get passed, or not an ordinance, excuse me. Um, uh, we're looking as the rec department um, is to uh, uh, change our daily fee to uh, $2 per customer after 6 p.m. Um, this was actually brought to us uh, by our, our managers, our pool managers. They were seeing a lot of membership people after 6, but no one no daily fees after six o'clock because not a lot of people want to pay the five or four dollars after six o'clock to use our aquatic center so basically what this would do would be to increase the daily admission because it's not even there uh, after six o'clock so that's that's the explanation for for this change um, is there any questions on that your expense stays the same during that time anyway so. Exactly. We, our belief is that we can maybe bring more NCC students that want to just come to the pool for two hours and stuff. So we just saw more memberships. We're coming after, but no daily admission because no one wants to pay the five or four dollars after six p.m. to be there. So you brought up seventy-five degree days. Do you, do you feel we need to revisit? how the ordinance is read for uh, what days the pool is open or is that just depends on if the clouds are out or how does that work um so i've seen um some pools they go by uh the attendance at a certain time so it could be after six o'clock if there's 10 or less or whatever the number you whatever number gets brought up 15 or less then they close down the pool or they close down or we could close down the slide or the only problem is a lot of people come to our aquatic center to use the slide so that's the issue that we have with that um, but that's how typically it, it gets run so it's kind of one of those tough issues that we've had I've been there personally when we've only had three kids there for three hours because the health inspector was there so I was there for three hours and we only had three kids there the whole time because it was like 72 degrees so it's just kind of how we want to operate I was under the assumption of we're open no matter what how many kids are there and that's how I will operate until I hear further okay Todd. So, so Wayne just so you understand there there was a time when we did close due to low numbers um, the council got a fair amount of negative feedback yeah. because we did that so we were told a number of years ago, if closing time is seven o'clock or eight o'clock, that's closed. <coughs> so that that addresses the evening hours, seventy seventy five. I. Right. I'm sure I'm not the first person who's ever asked that question. Yeah. Would it would it save us any? Maybe would it increase the complaints you guys get? Likely. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fair enough. I like the idea of trying to increase utilization because that solves a lot of issues, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can, if we can make same amount of money with more people coming, fine. Is there any data uh, about uh, how many out of town 
uh, the out-of-town numbers that we have? Sadly, we don't have that type of system. Um, example, at the, like, the LRC, they have that where they could do that. We don't have that type of system. Ours is just the old... <laughs> the old checkbox kind of thing. So, so it's hard for us to grab all those type of stats um, without having that that kind of system, which is expensive, as you would probably know. <laughs> and then uh, just an update on uh, we have an update from the indoor. Um, just just so everyone knows is. According to the agreement, the the city doesn't have we don't we don't run the pool we don't operate the pool. Um, this summer, uh, um, Sam told us to go out there and check and make sure at least that it's um, the bathrooms and everything was clean at least for the facility. So we maybe went above and beyond our agreement that we have with the indoor pool. Um, but they're currently going under construction as we speak. Um, and, uh, and Will the indoor pool ever open again? <laughs> it will. Um, once, once we get the okay from them, um, we will put that on our social media as well as other, other ways possible. So. Um, we're trying to. We've been in communication with them. We're trying to keep them up to date and get us feedback, so then we can feedback the public. We don't want to give you false information. So once we get the okay, uh, we'll let everyone know um, as well. So yeah, I know it's a great amenity and it's missed, and I hear about it all the time. And there's nothing we can do. There's certainly nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's unfortunate. No, but. There is a lot of neg negativity out there with it, but I will say, I try to be optimistic, the positive thing that comes out of this aquatic center is if anyone that's ever had someone in swimming lessons, us being able to not close our swimming lessons or delay our swimming lessons and being able to move, use that facility for that has been huge. Um, there was, I could probably say, we had 15 to 18 times this year where we had to use that indoor facility because of weather. So trying to be optimistic about the situation. So um, it's a good amenity to, to have for us as a community, so. All right, uh, we need a motion, I think, to approve the recommendation to lower the admission from five to two after 6 p.m. So moved. Support. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Marijuana. Aye. Kent. Aye. Hamill. Aye. Brewster. Aye. Eggers. Aye. All right. Thanks, Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> All right. Moving forward here. Lyle, I understand you have a letter you'd like to read to us. <laughs> Do we need to get Kleenex ready first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might. Maybe for me. <laughs> um, I'll do my best here. As you all are already aware, I have submitted my notice of my intentions to retire on November 27 after completing over 30 years of service with the Sheldon Police Department. I have many memories of my years at Sheldon PD that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Police officers oftentimes get to see people at their very best and also at their very worst. I've had the opportunity to do some very rewarding things as a police officer. I've also had to walk beside people who were overcome with grief and have cried with them while telling them that their loved one had died, knowing that their lives would never be the same again. I've met people who have far more character and class than I ever could have imagined. I've also met people who are evil to the very roots of their soul. Sometimes I've been surprised by who was actually evil and who was good. Policing has become increasingly challenging over the past 30 years. Technological changes are very difficult to keep up with, and most of these changes are very costly. The number of applicants for police jobs are down dramatically. Budget constraints are something we all have to deal with. Some of the people we have to deal with are becoming increasingly challenging and difficult. The level of respect for officers has declined. There's an overall decline in morality in our country. The profession of being a police officer is, da is very dangerous. Every day our officers put on their uniforms, 
while facing the reality that today might be their last day. We've sometimes attended funerals of fallen officers and have had to face the reality that we're not invincible. I would like to thank some individuals that have made a special impact on my life. Uh, first. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my Heavenly Father for watching over and protecting me and hiding me underneath the shelter of his wings. He has blessed me far more than I could have possibly imagined. I want to thank my wife, Brenda, for always supporting me. Thank you for always being there for me through the good times and the bad. I'd like to thank my children. It's not always fun having a dad who's a police officer. Thank you for your support. I'd like to thank my mother, who's present here today, who I'm certain has prayed for me every day for the past 30 years. I'd like to thank our Sheldon PD officers. They work to protect our citizens every second of every hour of every day of every month of every year, and you should be proud of each and every one of them. They perform their duties admirably. Their jobs are very challenging. Remember them in your prayers and express your appreciation for them when you see them on the streets. I'd like to thank my administrative assistant, Elaine Bogart, for everything she does for our department. She has many duties she faithfully performs each day, oftentimes fills the role of being our team mom. I would also like to thank the area law enforcement agencies who our department works with on a daily basis. Sheldon PD has a close relationship with several different agencies and have benefited from their assistance on countless occasions. I'd like to give a special thanks to the deputies, dispatchers, and jailers at the O'Brien County Sheriff's Department. Their assistance to our department is greatly appreciated and we couldn't do our jobs without them. I personally have gotten to know several police chiefs and sheriffs over my years at Sheldon PD as well. I won't mention any of them by name for fear that I might forget someone, but they know who they are. I'm grateful for their mentoring, their support, their friendships, and the many conversations we've had over the years. I'd also like to thank every city employee I've had the privilege of working side by side with. We truly are a family that works well together, and I'll miss you all. Special thanks to Sam, Todd, Angie, and Kurt. I've attended more meetings with you than I care to count. I sometimes see more of you than I do with my own family. I heard once that the average person spends a year of their life attending meetings. I think some of us would have to admit that our attendance at meetings is above average. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. I'd also like to thank Mayor Gales and the City Council for everything they have done for the City of Sheldon and for our department. You have thankless jobs, get paid almost nothing, and yet have to sometimes endure criticism and cynicism from people who are sure they know how to do your jobs better than you do. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to thank the citizens of Sheldon who have allowed me to be their police chief for the past 16 and a half years. I've been overwhelmed by the many expressions of gratitude the public has given me during the past weeks after announcing my retirement plans. Sheldon is filled with many great people and I'll always be grateful for their support for me and our department. God bless. While on behalf of the city, my honor and privilege to say thank you long time. Wish you the best.
All right. Moving forward, then. Uh, it is my request that you would confirm the appointment of officer. Do we need to accept? Oh, yes, yes, correct. Hold on. Let's, uh... <laughs> well, I know that. <laughs> we need a motion to accept Lyle's uh, re re resignation, retirement, uh, before we can move on here. With uh, great regret, I will uh, make that motion to accept Lyle, Chief Balcomus resignation letter. I will support that. Roll call, please. Hamill. Aye. Hintz? Aye. Barahona? Aye. Eggers? Aye. Brewster? Aye. All right. Now moving forward. At this point, I would like to ask for uh, your confirmation of David Dykstra to step in as the interim chief of police. He has tenure on the force. Uh, he is willing to do this job uh, for the interim. He is not interested in being, serving as our next full-time chief. But at this point, I would ask that you, uh, I would entertain a motion to uh, accept him as our interim chief. So move. Second. Any comments? Thank you, David, for being willing to do that. Roll call, please. Eggers. Aye. Hamill. Aye. Brewster. Aye. Verona. Aye. Kent. Aye. Then the work begins of finding a replacement. Uh, there are different ways we could go. I'm going to let Sam explain what uh, we've kind of talked about, what he's thinking. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I've already uh, taken steps to update the job description. The updated draft is in is in your uh, packets. Not a lot of changes to it. Uh, the last time the job description was updated was prior to 2003 when we had a dispatch center, so references to that have been removed. The rest of it is basically the same. Uh, Iowa code has changed a little bit too, and so Micah helped me update the job description in, in that regard regarding the um, the minimum requirements for the position. It is my recommendation, and I will also fully support if you decide you want to uh, keep it uh, in keep it a, an internal uh, process in terms of managing the uh, application. <coughs> I do recommend that we consider a request for qualifications uh, and seek proposals from qualified consultants. I printed this out for all of you, also given a couple of copies to the media table. And uh, I think it is worth uh, considering. The cost, based on what I've been able to gather so far, will probably be in somewhere in the in the ten dollars to $15,000 uh, range. Uh, I think that is a worthwhile cost to consider. I am asking that uh, that those who respond submit an hourly rate or a a la carte rate so that I can help keep the cost down because there's a lot that I can do to help reduce uh, the cost. I think having the having the uh, and I'll just speak from my my own experience, having gone through uh, the process just a year ago. I think having a, a consultant uh, that you can ask that candidates can potential candidates can ask questions of that you probably might not be comfortable calling the mayor and asking or calling the city manager and asking talking to uh, somebody in law enforcement over at Storm Lake uh, at a meeting recently uh, law enforcement applications are down and so we and they're down significantly across the country and across the state and uh, we we want to uh, Make sure we, we find the right person. The right person might be internal. And that right person might be external. And I think having a, uh, a consultant to help us uh, with the process, uh, the, the two people, I, I've been in contact with three, two are former chiefs of police, and the other is a, um, a city manager who's done, uh, who has a consulting firm who has done chief of police searches as well. And so those are the main three. And I've also reached out to the Iowa League of Cities to see if there's any there's any more. So stand for questions. I think after going through the search for city manager twice, I think the second time was a lot easier on the council and the mayor um, of that process. And I think we got better candidates the second time around. Um, and if we had questions, about the process, it was easy for us to get a hold of the consultants and ask them questions. 
without having to burden the mayor. So I, I think it's worthwhile looking into, see what the fees costs are. Um, I think this day and age, I think we need to have the best candidates that we can in law enforcement. To add to that, I'd say I think the negotiation process went fairly smooth too, because we didn't we were able to utilize the expertise mm -hmm. of that consultant as well. So. Yep. And I think that we saw that they had access to more people than we would ever access on our own. Yep, correct. I think we also have to recognize that there's a cost for us to do it as well. And it isn't just in the advertising of it, but in time and, uh, and effort that it takes to, uh, to facilitate what these people do very well. Um, I think it's something very much worth consideration. This is a professional position that is integral to our community, and it, it deserves for us to be able to, to, re, to view the very best options. So, And if you think about it, we're all members of the community coming from different subsects, some different cross-sections. None of us here, I would think, would be qual uniquely qualified to identify the best potential candidate for police chief. There's a tool for every job. Uh, I've been accused of being a tool more than once, but um, but no, I, I think we, especially in a scenario that uh, you know, Chief Bolkmo is with us for over 16 years, and Lord willing, we'll have the next person that we hire will be in this position for, for that amount of time as well. And I don't think we, uh, this is not something we want to cheap out on uh, just to save a buck with knowing how much this means for our future. Because not only will this new police chief have to manage the staff in place here, but this new police chief is also going to be integral in uh, trying to get new officers to join. Because as you mentioned, we are at a definite lack of, of qualified law enforcement candidates just in general. So uh, making sure that we have the right person as police chief is going to be paramount because that might be the difference between a, a, a law enforcement candidate going to city A versus city B because of who that police chief is. Any further comments? So I guess I would make a motion that we uh, we pursue the uh, the costs, the, the cost analysis for uh, what a firm would charge, and then uh, act upon that once we have more information on what a firm would do. Support. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Eggers. Aye. Hintz. Aye. Barahona. Aye. Hamill. Aye. Brewster. Aye. All right, that carries. At this time, we would like to hear from you, Sam, on your report. If there's anything to say, I don't have anything to add. Okay. That's what we love about you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> anything from you guys over there? You're ready to hate me, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple of things. Uh, some of you may have noticed the uh, street sweepers been uh, kind of burning the midnight oil and working on Saturdays. Uh, in case you're wondering, the reason we did that is because. Uh, leaves have been falling late and the weather is not cooperating, so we wanted to get every helpful hour we can get those off of the street as possible. Um, if you didn't know, we really can't sweep. Uh, the street paper has uh, carries water and and sprays for two reasons: one for dust control, and two for the manufacturer in front of that water. So that's why we were working some more time with that. Uh, a couple project updates. The asphalt overlay that Blacktop Services was uh, hired to do on uh, 8th Street, uh, 5th Avenue, and 4th Avenue was complete. Um, satisfied with the work there. I, I haven't seen the final quantities yet, but uh, spot checks during. I expect that to come in uh, uh, very much on budget. Um, 16th Street, 
Omni Engineering had their subcontractor come back and uh, Edge Mill and, uh, place uh, more material on 16th Street. It now needs crown, so that's a good thing. We'll have better drainage. Um, it also doesn't have the surface segregation any longer, so I'm happy with that. They still need to come back and uh, bring the manholes up to grade, and there's one residential driveway that uh, we denied also that still needs to be replaced. Uh, we'll see if we get that done. Temperature. Um, Crossroads North, uh, just to give you an FYI, the completion date on that project was October 31. Obviously, uh, that is not done with the project. The sewer main is in and did pass pressure test. The manholes uh, still need to be pressure test. The water main, I believe they finished that today. Uh, they've got a lot of paving yet. We meeting yesterday with the contractor. Obviously, the main concern I shared with them was we do not build up uh, a project. So they are putting together some documentation that says they'll provide uh, uh, temporary access to that lot if it, or whatever they need to do to not build up any progress they like to make on their, um, their. And then uh, last would be wastewater treatment plant. Um, they are finishing up the demo and uh, hopefully going to do some grading and potentially spread some more topsoil. Uh, get this, get this week. It's snowing. That's what I have unless you have questions. Got snow plows on yet? <laughs> we do not, but we can mount them very quick. The trucks are ready to go. Okay. Kurt, anything you'd like to share? Lyle, you have anything else? You said your piece. All right, very good. Uh, just a quick reminder. Or not me. Councilman to the left, any comments from you guys? Uh, Monday, Veterans Day. Uh, thanks to all the veterans in our community, and if you get a chance, get out to one of the schools for the activities. Thanks, Sean. Councilman to my right. Just want to say thanks again, Lyle. We appreciate you. All right. uh, just a reminder now with the uh, November 1 change of calendar uh, parking on the streets if you don't know already is uh, now in effect the ban from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, it starts with a friendly warning and then a ten dollar ticket is that right so just a reminder to the public for that I have nothing further so I would entertain, to entertain a motion to adjourn at this so time. So moved. Support. Roll call please. Eggers. Aye. Barahona. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Brewster. Aye. Hamill. Aye.